на Валди. In April 1928, I divorced Eddie Sutherland, leaving a pretty house in Laurel Canyon, where we'd done a lot of entertaining, for a lonely suite in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Staring down at my name in lights on the marquee of the Wilshire Theatre was like reading an advertisement of my isolation. Someday, I thought, I would run away from Hollywood forever, not just the temporary running away I did after making each of my films, but forever. Louise Brooks was always to retain a very unclouded view of the attractions of Hollywood. She constantly crossed swords with her producer at Paramount, B.P. Schulberg, who was more than usually volatile because of the imminent arrival of sound. He wanted Brooks to cooperate in converting her latest picture, The Canary Murder Case, into a talkie, but she was already bored with Hollywood. She was more interested in her relationship with a rich laundry magnate from the East, George Marshall. Marshall took on the management of her professional and financial affairs. He called me one day and he said, you know, in September, he said, you know, tomorrow your option comes up. He called me from Washington. I said, oh, really? He said, yes, Monte Bell, MGM called me and told me all about it. And he said, now look, when you go in to see Schulberg, he's going to tell you that he will keep you on at 750 a week, but he won't give you the raise in your option. And he said, I also know that some guy in Berlin called Pabst wants you for a very famous picture, I hear. And he'll give you $1,000 a week. So you let Schulberg talk, and when he's finished, you say, thank you, Mr. Schulberg, but I'll quit and go to Germany. And that is what I did, much to Mr. Schulberg's surprise. At the Eden Hotel, where I stayed in Berlin, the cafe bar was lined with the higher-priced trollops. The economy girls walked the streets outside. On the corner stood the girls in boots advertising flagellation. Actors' agents pimped for the ladies in luxury apartments in the Bavarian Quarter. Racetrack touts at the Hopa Garden arranged orgies for groups of sportsmen. The nightclub El Dorado displayed an enticing line of homosexuals dressed as women. At the Mali, there was a choice of feminine or collar and tie lesbians. Collective lust roared unashamed at the theater. In the review, Chocolate Kiddies, when Josephine Baker appeared naked except for a girdle of bananas, it was precisely as described by Vedekind. They rage there as in a menagerie when the meat appears at the cage. The project which had drawn Louise Brooks to Berlin was a film version of Vedekind's classic play, Pandora's Box. As a panorama of depravity and low life, the play was particularly appropriate to the decadence of Berlin in the late 20s. At the time Vedekind produced Pandora's Box in Berlin around the turn of the century, it was detested, condemned and banned. It was declared to be immoral and inartistic. If in that period when the sacred pleasures of the ruling class were comparatively private, a play exposing them had called out the dogs of law, how much more savage would be the attack upon a film faithful to Vedekin's text, which was made in 1928 in Berlin, where the ruling class publicly flaunted its pleasures as a symbol of wealth and power. The new Vedekin film was in the hands of G.W. Pabst, an outstanding German director with a suitably unsentimental moral outlook. His crucial decision was the casting of the central character, the amoral pleasure seeker, Lulu. Having seen Brooks in the 1928 film, A Girl in Every Port, he decided to summon her to Berlin. We met on the platform of the station Amso, and uh, I don't know, it was just as if we'd known each other forever. It was the most curious experience I've ever had in my life. He understood me absolutely perfectly, because that really was his genius. What was it that Pabst saw in her that um, convinced him that this was the person to play the part of Lulu? Well, the part of Lulu is a sort of beautiful, destructive character. And uh, if you looked at Louise Brooks, you can find all those things in her. And uh, she conveyed it really quite beautifully, effectively. And um, she had a great depth to it, which American films really never made quite use of.
Lulu is not a real character, Vedekin said in a commentary, but the personification of primitive sexuality who inspires evil unaware. She plays a purely passive role. Besides daring to show the prostitute as the victim, Mr. Paps went on to the final damning immorality of making his Lulu as sweetly innocent as the flowers that adorned her costumes and filled the scenes of the play. finished he grabbed me and picked me up and he said oh but you are a dancer not very good but but what i'm getting at is that he treated everyone completely differently now with Corton, with a great actor from the theater he would take him aside and in that careful precise way they would talk over everything now that didn't really mean anything because paps never wanted a set performance he wanted it to be new and living in her scenes with the doomed industrialist, Dr. Schoen, Brooks found herself playing opposite one of the most eminent German actors of the time. Fritz Kortner had a histrionic style which Pabs clearly enjoyed. Nevertheless, he made sure that Kortner was unable to upstage his young star. wasn't giving his set performance at all. Of course, any director can keep an actor fresh, but he always treated Cortner as if he was going to do exactly the way Cortner. And very often, Cortner began to bellyache about his back, this marvelous back being humped over in so many scenes. And the, he said, but you're only shooting Miss Brooks. That started the thing that he was spoiling me. And each person, this was a difficult picture because they were all difficult. The old man was difficult. He was always getting well, drunk. Shagulz, he was a marvelous actor. But he should be, right? Yes. He should he, be. I was a dirty old man. Right? Yeah, and he even smelled the father, part. Maybe you'll oh, he was, uh, he was perfect. He, he stunk. But uh, the one he had real trouble with was Alice Robert. Her husband had put some money in the picture. She was a Belgian. She spoke just enough English to insult me. And. Uh, she was very tall and precise and... and uh, oh, did she have any idea that she was to play a lesbian? No, that's the joke. She's the Countess she, Gishfitz. Huh? Yes. yes, and the scene she played, that was the wedding night, when uh, Courtner finds me dancing the tango with her. Uh, we were having a love affair on the side. She rehearsed the scene. Adios, machachos, compañero, demi vida. I was looking at her. And she absolutely froze and... Uh, Walked off the set, and perhaps looked. He was always very calm, and I thought, gee, this is pretty funny, because I'd known lesbians all my life. But I thought, now what the hell's he going to do? He went off, and I saw them talk. She in her black satin dress. And pretty soon they came back, and she was smiling. And this is what he did. He let her look as cross as possible when in a two-shot with me, because it was marvelous, and she looked like a very repressed lesbian who was hiding it. It's kind of that glare. Then when he did close-ups with her, he would stand off and play the scene with her so that she could do a true love scene with him. <laughs> <laughs> and she turned out to be marvelous. Uh, so I say he was a director like, almost every director follows a pattern, pretty much treats everyone the same, but he didn't. 
Most directors and most great directors, for instance, Lubitsch, they use the same technique with everyone. Lubitsch acted out every scene and acted it out marvelously. I don't know whether I could work with him. And showing the actor how to do Every it. move, every move. Eddie Goulding, the same way. He even showed Garbo how to cross the library, I, I mean the hotel lobby in Grand Hotel. And he was right, uh, uh, because they were extraordinary. Uh, but most directors are terrible. But Pabst never acted anything. But he treated everybody completely different. Mm -hmm. For instance, he sat one day uh, with me, and we were chewing on some old dead uh, sauerkraut and ham or something. And he said, Luis, this afternoon you must cry. And that's all he told me about the scene, and I went into the scene, and I cried. I was treated by Pabst with a kind of decency and respect unknown to me in Hollywood. It was just as if he had sat in on my whole life and career and knew exactly where I needed assurance and protection. And just as his understanding of me reached back to his knowledge of a past we did not have to speak about, so it was with the present. For although we were together constantly, he seldom spoke to me. All that I thought and all his reactions seemed to pass between us in a kind of wordless communication. To other people surrounding him, he would talk endlessly in that watchful way of his, smiling, intense, speaking quietly with his wonderful hissing precision. But to me, he might speak never a word all morning and then at lunch turn suddenly and say, Luis? This afternoon, you must be ready to do a big fight scene with Kortner. By some magic, he would saturate me with one clear emotion and turn me loose. Fritz Kortner hated me. In his role of Dr. Schoen, he had feelings for me, or for the character Lulu, that combined sexual passion with an equally passionate desire to destroy me. One sequence gave him an opportunity to shake me with such violence that he left 10 black and blue fingerprints on my arms. Both he and Pabst were well pleased with that scene because Pabst's feelings for me, like Kortner's, were not unlike those of Schoen for Lulu. I think that in the films Pabst made with me, he was conducting an investigation into his relations with women, with the object of conquering any passion that interfered with his passion for his work. One of the only surviving members of Pabst's original production team is the Russian émigré assistant director, Mark Sorkin. Pabst, any time, looking for a girl or whatever for this, or to have a name, have not a name, you know, not important. He have to be absolute born for this role. You know, that was his principle. You know. She was very independent. And she, when she working with the people in the film, she have an opinion, an opinion what she have to do. That was her opinion. Most of the time, the opinion was right, what she had to do, mostly time. With gross overconfidence in my rights and power, I at first defied Pabst with arrogance. Pabst chose all my costumes with care. He wanted the actors working with me to feel my flesh under a dancing costume, a blouse and skirt, a nightgown. The morning of the sequence in which I was to go from my bath into a love scene with Franz Lederer, I came on the set wrapped in a gorgeous negligee of painted yellow silk. Carrying the bathrobe I refused to wear, I approached Mr. Pabst to receive the lash. Louise, you must wear the bathrobe and be naked under it. Why, I hate it, I said. Who will know that I'm naked under that big woolly white bathrobe? Lederer, he said. Stunned by such a reasonable argument, I retired without another word and changed into the bathrobe. 